Earth things. Welcome along to another vegan time tunnel. Not quite sure what number it is. It must be getting into the eights and nines now. Um, what we're going to do um, this time is kind of start a little bit of a mini series within the actual time tunnel itself, in the sense that it's Women's History Month uh, this month. Uh, and so I thought this is a good time to start the the look at the women pioneers of the movement because uh, they're often overlooked or downplayed, which is a kind of common thing within the social movements in general. So, um, hmm. so the time tunnel itself, we're building up an archive. And so uh, that's the entire idea of things. And so hopefully then we'll have in one place a whole series of videos, which we usually try to go for 30 to 40 uh, minutes. Um, there will be a couple shorter than that, which is probably a good thing. Um, and so that's the idea, just to have them all in one place to kind of create a kind of archive of um, of the history of the movement. So welcome then to the Vegan Time Tunnel. Yes, indeed. So the women pioneers of our movement, uh, in fact. And so um, when I've done this before, I've called it the founding mothers because we get a lot of rhetoric in the movement about the founding fathers of the movement. But these, if you like, are the founding mothers of the vegan social movement. And again, I want to stress that when I talk about the vegan social movement, I'm talking not about the people who went plant based for the first time or were concerned about other animals or anything like that, these are the people who came together and put together a social movement, which they called a cause. So that's what that what marks them out uh, for me. Um, these are the people who formed the vegan social movement and also gave it its name, uh, of course. So this is part one of three of this kind of mini series within the time tunnels. It, it, won't, it won't be week on week, but it will be three in the end, if you like. And the first two people, are those you can see on your screen, Elsie Shrigley and uh, Dot uh, Watson or Dorothy Morgan, as uh, she was. And um, Elsie Shrigley was also called Sally Shrigley. So <laughs> there's a lot of name play going on. Now, a general point that we say at this stage is that the demographics of the animal movement or the movements, so whether you're talking animal welfare, or animal rights or animal liberation, it's the same for all of them. Um, it's been revealed that most people involved are and always have been women. For example, there's an interesting thing that I found in the Washington Post from 2019. And they say, we found that political conservatives and more religious Americans were less likely to support animal rights. Women were much more likely than men to support them, the animal rights movement. Most interestingly, however, we found that attitudes about LGBT rights, universal health care, welfare of the poor, improving conditions of African Americans, and supporting birthright citizenship for US born children of undocumented uh, immigrants were all strongly associated with views about animal rights and they conclude in other words people who supported an expansive concept of human rights and welfare were also most likely to support animal rights so that part of the survey that we're focused on of course today is the fact that most people in the movement are, are women and kind of always have been but then there is a movement issue that feminists have pointed out. Like this one, in the patriarchal space of non-human animal rights activism, the voices and con uh, contributions of many women who helped build the movement are generally silenced or forgotten. That's a bait from the vegan feminist uh, network. It's claimed that even in, in a movement then with a membership historically and currently dominated by women, 
women's voices are often the least heard. Now, the very first version of, of this time tunnel talk that I ever did was for VegFest. And so I remembered when I came into the movement, and we talk about the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, it coincided with the time when women were very, very prominent uh, in the movement, or at least in the movement that I knew, uh, i.e. the British movement uh, spreading over to the North American one. For example, in Britain, people like Paddy Broughton and Margaret Manzoni were the management, really, of the BYV, the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection. Angela Walder was their scientific advisor at the time. Jean Pink, she founded Animal Aid in 1977. Juliet Gelatly was and still is the prime mover of uh, Viva. Jan Creamer founded uh, ADI, which stands for Animal Defenders International. And she worked for the NAVS, which is the National Anti-Vivisection Society. Louise Wallace was the NAVS regional campaigns officer in the 1980s. And then she moved to the Vegan Society. And she is the person who initiated the annual World Vegan Day uh, events. Mimi and Jenny Spence, I remember from my time sabbing, ran the Essex Hunt Saboteurs Association. Muriel the Lady Dowding was co-founder of Beauty Without Cruelty and also active in the Lord Dowding Fund for Humane Research. And then when it comes to authors, we have people like Rebecca Hall, who published Voiceless Victims, probably not a name that is much known now. But we've also got Bridget Brophy, wrote a uh, very controversial, not controversial, but um, influential uh, article in 1965 about animal rights. Then we've got books by Ruth Harrison and Rachel Carsons. We've got Ingrid Newkirk in the States, founding uh, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And in Ireland, we have people like Bernie Wright and Nuala Donlan, who were amongst the co-founders of a group called AFAR, which stands for Alliance for Animal Rights. So when I came into the movement, it was really interesting. Women were very prominent. But the general idea is that, is that there's a visibility. Can we bring that back up? I'll, I'll, I'll address that. I think this subject is something I need to write a poem about, yeah. <laughs> need more research. Yeah. Do, 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 I like I like that. W P O T V S M are oh, great. Yes, they are indeed. So the issue now, I suppose, and there's times when this is worse and sometimes better, as it were, is the general invisibility of women you know and that applies to the start of the vegan social movement so much so that samantha calvert this is dr calvert of the vegan society now i'm not quite sure what post she holds now but she was the head of communications and she wrote in veggie vision tv which is still going and run by karen ridges another strong woman of the movement, she described Elsie Shrigley as a shadowy figure in the movement, despite a figure. And you'll see that being repeated really with, with what's to come. So in August 1944, Elsie Beatrice Shrigley, often known as Sally for some reason, don't ask me why, I don't know that bit, joined with Donald Watson in pushing for a non-dairy section of the Vegetarian Society. So we've, you know, we've covered this uh, already in a previous um, time tunnel. And so we saw then that the Vegetarian Society, in a friendly kind of way, said no to this idea of a non-dairy section. And they basically said, no, just strike out on your own. And so that's what they did. And then hence, the vegan social movement was born in 1944. However, Shrigley herself was involved in the internal 
um, affairs and issues of uh, the Vegetarian Society for many years after 1944. And also that that's the case with many of the other vegan pioneers. They talked at the International Vegetarian Union Congresses in the late 1940s, throughout the 1950s, into the 1960s, and sometimes as late as 1980. Um, so this goes back to something really that um, that Donald Watson developed, which is the kind of veganism. Veganism is critical of vegetarianism, but shouldn't be a question of attacking vegetarians. So that that was that was a distinction that they made uh, then. Now going back again to the formation of the movement, uh, this is what Shrigley herself. Uh, said, I'm not. I'm not going to read this all, all this out. Just some of it. She's talking about 1944 to 1965. What memories I have of those years? The first meeting on Sunday, November the fifth, 1944. Bracket a sunny day, which is, <laughs> which is always interesting. The fact that um, a British person would have to mark the fact that it was sunny in November <laughs> at the Attic Club near Holland Station. So this is in London, where the name vegan was decided and future plans discussed. The meetings, social and annual general meetings were very enthusiastic. And then we have some of the early issues. In, in the 1950s, some vegans were ill. And I remember with gratitude the help given to us by many vegetarian doctors and Dr. F. Uh, Wokes. Um, not woke, Wokes. And um, it's interesting that because you know we tend to think of, of vegetarian doctors and certainly vegan doctors as something that is rather new, but they existed uh, even back then. And then she said towards the bottom, I am more thrilled than most that the society is celebrating its uh, 21st um, birthday. So uh, this is her recollection of the founding of the movement, this little kind of band of people who got together and just did what the vegetarians said, strike out on, on your own. They didn't expect that they would have to do it. So suddenly these people who were pushing for a section of the veg vegetarian society found themselves starting an entirely new social movement, which, which is not what they expected. In the third edition of the Vegan News, and that was published in May 1945, Donald Watson reports on the formation of a temporary committee of the Vegan Society. The committee held meetings uh, every month, and they'd held one earlier in April. And they began the process of expanding the concerns of the so-called non-dairy vegetarians far beyond what was called in those days the milk issue. And Watson writes this about the new movement's aims. It was unanimously decided that the society, which had developed from a small group of non-dairy vegetarians, should work for the abolition, not only of all food of animal origin, but also of commodities made from animal products, in particular, those from the slaughterhouse. So this essentially is the start of the evolution of what we now regard as vegan philosophy, which was done finished, if you like, by about 1955. So it took quite a, a long time. Uh, going back to what Shrigley said about the health problems, uh, they really had to prove in the very early years that um, it was feasible to live on a plant uh, diet. And so that's what they set out to do. And again, I mentioned this in another time tunnel because they were told by a lot of doctors I don't know whether the vegetarians were included in, on this, but they were told by their friends as well that they were going to die. They were literally going to die. And so they had to prove in the early years of the society that it was actually feasible to live on a plant uh, diet. So Shrigley becomes elected as a committee member and also a committee member of the London Vegan Group. The London Vegan Group was formed in July 1945 and it was initially separated from the National Vegan Society. And Watson reports that she gave a talk at their first meeting, arguing that the vegan's diet was clean, humane, and logical. 
by the time of the publication of the spring 1946 edition of The Vegan. So it changed from The Vegan News to The Vegan. So this was the first properly printed version of The Vegan Social Movement magazine. So even there is interesting because it took almost kind of two years for this, or at least 18 months for this uh, to happen. It, it's interesting from our point of view now in the internet, internet age, how, how kind of slow things were. And so they were founded November 44, but they didn't even get a proper magazine together until 1946, you know, that kind of thing. Shrigley was announced as the Society's Press and Minutes uh, Secretary, which is an interesting thing. And uh, again, you could probably make some feminist related points um, about that, I imagine. In 1947, Shrigley had begun a series in the magazine entitled Food, uh, sorry, Report of Food Investigations. Now, this is interesting. 1947, she concentrated on chocolates, sweets, and biscuits in the autumn edition of the mag. So I suppose a concentration on chocolate, sweets, and biscuits meant that even back there, then, she really knew how vegans uh, ticked, and so she knew what was um, of concern to them. But more seriously than that is these are the end of the war years, and so that meant that rationing was still continuing, and so there was a lot of hardship after the war and possibly, especially those early vegan pioneers who would declare themselves as conscientious objectors. So that was quite interesting. So it must have meant that sweet stuffs in those days were a great treat because we would immediate uh, years after the war and you know things were trying to get back to normal, I suppose. I suppose it's surprising though, that there seems to be no shortage of chocolate suitable for vegans in 1947, which again is not something you'd, you'd expect, is it? You'd expect that there would be no such thing, but th that's that's not the case. Now, Sam Calvert, the um, historian, said that Shrigley's early work on the products suitable for vegans, and this is one of the things that the Vegan Society really kind of went for, because there was no labeling back in those days. You've got, we've got to remember that again, Things were much, much different in those days. Everything was slower, but everything was more difficult. There was no labels on the jars and, and the packets. And so it all had to be done by letter and then confirmation, keep uh, tracking it, this kind of thing. She said, um, Calvert says that Shrigley's work laid the groundwork for something called the Animal Free Shopper, which was published every year by the Vegan Society for a long time. It's a very small little booklet which you used to be able to put in your pocket. And all vegans of my generation would have one. And it was kind of a, a godsend, really, because you, you'd go into a supermarket and you'd get your little shopper out and it would virtually tell you what, you know, was okay and what uh, wasn't really. Uh, it was obviously before the age uh, of the internet. Shrigley was to work for the vegan movement in one capacity or another for 33 years until she died in 1978, which is a pretty good uh, track record. She was, as said, a vegan delegate at the Congresses of the International Vegetarian Union. She was a, a, a longtime member of the Vegan Society's committee. And then in the 1960s, she was the organization's deputy president, and then she became the president uh, as well. And so in 1967, in a warm tribute entitled Vegan Since 1944 by someone called SNC. Now, I've never been able to figure out who that was, but I think it's probably Serena Coles, a person called Serena Coles, who was a committee member of the Vegan Society at this time. She wrote an obituary relief or a tribute saying, Elsie Shrigley was remembered as a pioneer of the movement who was still playing an active part in the outworking of the idealists who first brought the society into being. Now, this, this little statement is really interesting. Um, th this happened a great deal. A lot of the early 
pioneers and then and then the ones who came like 10 years later they were urging the people in the movement to stay kind of faithful to the to the developing philosophy and the radical view of the founders of the movement and that went right through to about the 1980s you can you can find little statements where and people like uh, Watson looking back you know 50 years and all that kind of stuff they would say you know don't remember uh, don't forget the you know the values of the pioneers they're very important we we want them to be upheld we don't want any kind of slippage uh, if you like uh, sadly slippage is exactly what's happened but that's what they wanted they wanted uh, a constituent um consistency of radical values which has sadly not really occurred now emphasizing once again the fact that the second world war was an important factor in the lives of many of the movement's co-founders it was noted that shrigley acted as a leader of the street it was called in the what was called the fire guard service so again some of the people who wouldn't fight in the war uh, ended up fighting fires in terms of being you know the bomb cities um, etc thanking shrigley for her service to the vegan cause snc finished with she had reminded us that the vegan society was formed because of correspondence in the vegetarian messenger of Leslie Cross, who inspired her to become a non-dairy vegetarian. Now, Leslie Cross, um, who is a man, <laughs> even though um, it can be confusing in that sense, Leslie Cross becomes a central player in the evolution of vegan philosophy. And so he will be a subject of a time tunnel uh, to come. Okay, so now we move to our second person, Dorothy Morgan. Now, in the acknowledgments of a book called Ecofeminism, Feminist Intersections with Other Animals and the Earth, which is edited by Carol J. Adams and Laurie Gruen, this is uh, 2000. 14. Dorothy Morgan is credited with coining the word vegan by taking the first three words and the last two words of vegetarian and putting them together. <laughs> She's also credited, I'm not quite sure if this is the right word, with marrying uh, Donald Watson. She helped to found the Vegan Society and she promoted veganism as both a worldview this emerging philosophy that I was talking about, and and a word, you know, the, I mean, the word didn't exist. It was a brand new word that um, that we were dealing with uh, for a brand new cause, a brand new social movement. Now, many of you will probably know that a number of other names were under active consideration uh, throughout this kind of very early period. These are some of them. So, all Vega was suggested. So. Basically, this little group of people, they, they were kind of, you know, doing a bit of a focus group and saying, OK, we've got to come up with a name. We're not non-dairy vegetarians anymore. So what are we? So all Vega was one. Dairy bands, the total vegetarian group, uh, neo-vegetarian, Vitan was one, and Benivore. So I always say at this point, I'm rather glad that they picked on the word uh, vegan because None of those other ones sound <laughs> very good to me, but, um, but there you go. Now, this is interesting because um, this is the Donald Watson archive. So we've got some sociologists working on the Donald Watson archive, and their names are there, Kate Stewart, Iris Crane, and Matthew Cole. And, um, well, I think, I think they kind of pointed out, or at least it is true that as another shadowy figure, really, there's not a lot out there about Dot Watson. Um, but it is claimed that uh, that Dot Watson and not Shrigley uh, co-founded or co-coined the word vegan along with her. I don't think he was a husband at the time. Could could have been at the time. So there's not a lot of, um, out there about uh, Dot or Dorothy Morgan, who became. Dorothy Watson, often usually called Dot uh, Watson. There, there is a story, though, that really 
seems to suggest a heck of a lot about her character, I think. And uh, this is this. And this is, takes place in 1951. Um, now, a neighbor of Donald and Dorothy had a glass conservatory. Now, these were new at the time. And so um, birds were not used to a building made almost of glass, even though I suppose um, greenhouses must have existed in those days. But as it were, a big kind of structure at the side of a building was kind of new to them. So not long after the construction of this conservatory, uh, birds began to crash into the glass because they couldn't see it. On one occasion, a barely alive female blackbird was found she had collided with a pane of glass and was lying with one eye hanging out of its socket. So even though this is Dorothy and, uh, uh, and Donald now, even though they thought the best thing to do might be to put the bird out of her misery, they just couldn't bring themselves to do it. So they left her in uh, with some water and tried to keep her comfy, as it were, for overnight both expecting that she would be dead in the morning. However, the next day, she was alive and her eye seemed to have popped back into place. So everything seemed to be grand uh, with this little bird. So they happily released her. And two days later, Dorothy Watson was in their yard. I think she was actually putting the washing out, <laughs> another stereotype. And she claims that a blackbird flew by her, dipping in flight. And she was convinced that this was the same bird saying thank you uh, to her. So whether that's true, I don't know. But it's a nice thing to, to believe to be true, isn't it? A nice little story. Now, this is interesting. This, uh, these are scenes from, we're getting to the end now, this, scenes from a Patreon post by an author called Lee Hall. And um, this essentially is Dorothy uh, and Donald's uh, grave. So she visited this church, which is called Crosswaith Church. And it's in near Keswick, which is a place called Cumbria. So if you, you probably can't see it very well, but the kind of bottom left there, there's a picture of, of Britain with Keswick kind of pointed out so um if people know the lake district in the northwest of of england just below scotland that that's where we we're talking about and so um yeah lee hall said uh donald watson uh married dorothy sometime after the war ended the pair settled in keswick cumbria they became active members of the cumbrian vegetarian society but by then and together with Elsie Shrigley and about two dozen like-minded people, they had already launched the vegan uh, movement. Now, what's interesting here, all right, Veganic Graham, we rescued a blackbird ages ago, got him back to good health. He came back often. All right, yeah, you see, that's, that's great, isn't it? Brilliant little stories, those. I love those. So, um, so this is the this is the grave really um, of the two of them, and it's um, an incredibly picturesque uh, place overlooking the lakes. Um, this is a a more maybe a more clear picture. It was it was bigger before, but I wanted to include the flowers in the bin because Lee Hall said that um, she wanted to. Uh, leave flowers but she wouldn't buy any and so she kind of raided the bin uh, for some second-hand ones uh, if you like she also says that dorothy and uh, donald were not among the notable people listed by the church uh, buried there so they actually they actually had difficulty finding the grave in the end there was no headstone for example and so what you get really is just this little mark in the ground, a little a, a little mark in the ground, which is where they were buried. So they didn't make a big deal um, out, out of that. You can see all around Lee Hall in that picture, there's, you know, kind of formal headstones. And, but what she's looking at is the actual grave of, um, 
of the two or two of the big uh, founders of the vegan movement. Right. So that is your first two of the powerful women of the vegan movement, Elsie Shrigley and Dorothy Morgan, who became Dorothy uh, Watson. So I haven't been looking at the chat whatsoever. So if I've missed anything, um, they can go back up. But also, um, if not, um, we can leave it a couple of minutes just to see. Yes, that's right, Deb. They did make uh, their mark as well. And um, I think, in fact, uh, just before Donald died, he gave an interview and um, I think um, somebody said, you know, what, what what was your achievement? And I think he said that not many people get to be the co-founder of um, a radical cause that could change history, essentially, uh, because, of course, you know, they had a big, um, very expansive view about, you know, what was the potential for for veganism. And so that was what they thought. And uh, so he said not many people get to do that, as it were. And so that is true. Right. OK. Now, a wonderful story indeed. That's good. I'm glad you liked it. Amazing history. Thank you for sharing this with us. And um, as I said, so that's just the first one of a little mini series within the Time Tunnel uh, series. So we'll be back um, with something else uh, next time. And then we shall revisit some of the uh, powerful uh, women uh, later. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And I um, hope you enjoy it. And we'll see you again on the Vegan Time Tunnel. Thanks a lot. Hello, Earthlings. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another vegan time tunnel uh, in a slightly different uh, arrangement, but uh, it's basically the same. So uh, we're building up an archive um, of uh, his historical things in the vegan stroke uh, animal rights, stroke animal liberation uh, movement. So that's what we're, we're at. Uh, today, we've got another one of our founding mothers or one of the strong female pioneers of the vegan social movement so this is a a nice uh, gentle time tunnel but it's an it's a nice um story too um also in terms of time we're not going very far today we, i mean we're kind of hovering around the early 40s but really in terms of the focus of this it's it's basically three years 46 47 and 48, and in particular 47. So that's kind of where we're at. So indeed, welcome to another time tunnel. Yes, the female pioneers, they need their voice amplifying in the sense that We've got that usual demographic graphic thing in the movement to point out in the sense that there's always been more women than men, and yet um, the more famous people in the movement tended to be uh, men, whether it's uh, speakers or organizers or um, writers, those those kind of things. But um, we're, we're in the business of changing that, at least as much as we can. In terms of the vegan social movement, there are quite a lot of of women who were very influential in the early years of the vegan social movement and that means the formation of um, the vegan society so this is faye henderson oh, i need my eyes for this now uh it's faye keeling henderson that's her full name so that's where the k uh, comes from and as i said 1947 uh, seems to be um, a big year for her really and um, the first thing I'm going to show you, it's not easy to read, actually, but this is um, Donald Watson's president's log in the uh, little bit Star Trek. It's the president's log, star date, 
Um, this is um, The Vegan, Volume 3, Number 1, from spring 1947. And Watson is essentially thanking the Hendersons, so that's Faye and also G. Uh, Alan Henderson, uh, for stepping in and um, taking some of the burden from his sh shoulders, essentially, uh, because... Well, it's funny, you know, I've often I've often described the beginning of the vegan social movement as a bit chaotic. I think I might change that now, because when you think about it, they did remarkably well in the sense that they didn't even know that they were going to be running a social movement. And so we've got that story about they applied to be a branch or a, a section of the vegetarians. So we're going to revisit that a little bit because um, Faye Henderson had something to say. Um, about that. Now, just as a side note, too, you might remember that I've mentioned that uh, when they were searching for the name that eventually became vegan, there were some weird and wonderful names that were suggested, like dairy bands. There's also all vegan and all vega suggested. And it was the Hendersons, apparently, who suggested um, those uh, two words. And it seems, according to the historians of the movement, that this is the reason why. I'm going to put this on full screen to give you a better chance of seeing it. The um, the picture on the right looks very almost like modern picture, I think. But um, this is the Vega Vegetarian Restaurant, and it's off Pall Mall in London. So the left one is an advert for it, and the right one is a bit of an advert, but also a photograph. By all accounts, this was very popular. There's a really interesting story about this restaurant. And again, this is... This is, we think, where they got the name Vega, which ended up being vegan. And so it was started by some Germans, Walter and Jenny Fleisch, their names, and they'd escaped from Germany because Walter found out, apparently, that he was number 17 on the Gestapo hit list. Now, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, that was, but it seemed to be the case. And so they fled to uh, from Germany. Um, I think they were interned for a while. And then they ended up uh, running a vegetarian restaurant, as you do, you know, kind of escape the Nazis, get a uh, interned, and then you open a veggie restaurant. It's just a, co a common way of doing it, I, I know. Anyway, um, Faye Henderson was much more visible, really, in the vegan movement than someone like, say, Dorothy Watson. Uh, on Dorothy Morgan, who became Dorothy Watson. For example, Faye, she wrote a lot of literature for the Vegan Society. She served as their vice president. She toured Britain and Ireland giving lectures and cookery demonstrations. And in fact, um, Scotland too, as we'll come on uh, to see. So this really is just like an advert really for the uh, cookery uh, class that she did. And, and she did this basically from a home in Cumbria, uh, which is by the English Lake District. So we're talking about northeast. Um, so it's above Liverpool, if, if you can picture that. So this is an advert for a special course, and that took place over two weeks, and it included things like lectures and demos, uh, practical demonstrations, uh, discussions, and garden advice. That was all included. And so Essentially, what people would do is they would go and have their holidays with them and then also do a vegan related uh, course. So that actually sounds pretty great, you know. So um, the Lazis uh, must not have been happy with, <laughs> with the veggie restaurant. Well, presumably they didn't know much about it. So um, let's hope not anyway. Uh, and the uh, the least we say about Nazis and vegetarianism, the, the better, because you know what the anti anti vegans say say about that. She also wrote a cookery book. Um, in fact, she wrote a, a couple, I think. But this is uh, vegan recipes. This is from 1946. Now, this is interesting as well because of the war. There was a problem getting it printed, um, so it had a very short print run because of the lack of paper uh, due to the, to the war. So that's another kind of interesting knock on. In fact, it's really interesting because um, some people have kind of said to me on TikTok and places like that, oh, well, you know, your, your movement has been going, going for a long time and it hasn't done much. And I have to point out that, yeah, but it, it was 
created during a global conflict. And then there was all rationing. And then there was lots of rationing afterwards. And fully, I don't think in Britain, the rationing really finished until the 1960s. So it's not as though it was easy to do in, in the first place. So even things like getting literature together and putting a book together in particular, that was difficult. But this was one that Faye did in uh, 46, as I said. Now, sociologist Matthew Cole, he's part of that uh, Donald Watson archive that I've mentioned. He suggests that Faye Henderson was a prime mover in pioneering what he called a consciousness raising model for vegan activism. In other words, he puts the emphasis um, on education, at least that's what she did. And to that end in 1947, and clearly understanding the idea of the vegan curious, uh, she wrote this, really interesting. It is our duty to recognize the obligation we owe to these creatures and to understand all that is involved in the consumption and use of their live and dead products. Only thus shall we be properly equipped to decide our own attitude to the question and explain the case to others who may be interested, but who have not given the matter serious thought. So that's an interesting quote, and, and it actually informs her general view um, about the relationship between vegans and vegetarians. We'll, we'll, we'll see that um, as we go along, but um, she was in particular very interested in maintaining vegan relations with uh, the vegetarians. And we're gonna come back to that story about, you know, the, the, the split or the, uh, you know, the kind of decision, if you like. So here she is writing in 1947, but she's writing in the vegetarian. So again, there was this, this link, you know, she maintained uh, contact with the vegetarian uh, community. And so she ended up um, in the, uh, magazines and, and documents, essentially. And she wrote, uh, it seems a colossal presumption that mankind, product of their time, obviously, should have interfered so tremendously in the life and liberty of the harmless creatures of the earth. But the result is indeed a sorry one. Directly due to men's exploitation, the animals have become both dependent and disease-ridden while man himself has drifted far from the happiness of healthy simplicity. So there's echoes there of the kind of thing that Watson would say, the kind of things that Cross would say. And then speaking of humans, she said, um, he has become physically diseased, morally depraved, and spiritually uh, degraded, which is a heck of a, a list of things to go wrong for humanity. But again, that goes back to the to the largeness of the vegan pioneers project in, in the sense that they saw that happening. They'd seen those world wars. They were shattered by it. Um, and, and then they thought, OK, we need to get, you know, we need to get uh, out of this. How do we do that? Uh, veganism. So animal liberation, human liberation, all tied up together. That's, that's how uh, we get out of it, essentially. This is going back now to the winter um, edition of The Vegetarian, still 1947. Uh, man will not no, uh, interfere knowingly with the lives of others. This is describing the vegan world, really. He will not kill or eat or drink, nor for clothing, but will find other more natural ways of feeding and protecting himself commentary from Ruger in the background. You'll have to wait, I'm afraid, Ruge. Um, He will not exploit neither man or beast, but strive to live harmoniously from day to day. So this was an article entitled Vegan Values. And then if you look at the back issues of the vegan uh, booklet uh, or magazine, you'll see that that in itself became a booklet. I think it was expanded to something like 19 pages. It was available through the Vegan Society for the princely sum of six old pence, um, which used to be called a tanner in those days. I think it's probably worth about half a half a cent or half a, you know, what, what yeah, you say cent in, in North America and Canada, don't you, cent in Australia? So a kind of euro cent, half a euro cent perhaps. So the article ends with this. 
It is hoped that any group of people with vegan sympathies in this or any other country will communicate with the vegan society here with a view to cooperating in the widest possible application of vegan principles. The forming of a vegan international movement will operate for peace and prosperity throughout the universe. So very Star Trek, um, not just uh, restricted to, to planet Earth, which was quite good. Uh, yeah, you, you really don't like this, do you? Don't, you don't like this time tunnel at all. Getting a real bad commentary here from, from Ruja. So, um, as I said before, then, Henderson, in particular, seemed very concerned with keeping the contacts within the vegetarian um, community. And she also has got her own version. I'm not going to read this out for you, but essentially, this is where she tells the story of the vegans attempting to create a non-vegan section of the vegetarian society. She seemed more upset and disappointed than most um, that the vegetarians had basically rejected uh, the vegans. And um, she hints that, um, in, in her account of it, she hints that the vegetarians saw veganism as extreme. And that was one of the reasons why they didn't really want this non-dairy section. And so it's interesting how, you know, you get some kind of moderate accounts, if you like, or some accounts where it just says, well, they were keen for the vegans to just do their own thing, man type of thing. Whereas, um, you know, Henderson is saying that, no, they, they, didn't, they didn't like where veganism was going and they didn't really want the vegetarians to be associated with it. So that was quite interesting. And so um, Henderson said that the Vegetarian Society decision uh, was appealed. And, um, and so she says that the uh, Vegetarian Society decision to cut ties with the soon to be vegans uh, was appealed, but to no avail, she said. And she also said that individual approaches were also ma made to the vegetarians. And they also said, kept saying no. And so that's the story that we've learned already that the vegan social movement gets up and running and a bit chaotically, as I've said, but understandably so, uh, in 1944, uh, with Watson's first bulletin uh, published in November of uh, that year. And of course, the interesting thing about that is that uh, November bec becomes World Vegan Month um, in the 1990s, and November the 1st being uh, World Vegan Day as well. So moving on to 1948, this is the edition of The Vegan now. Anderson wrote an ominous piece entitled You Have Been Warned. Um, now, one interesting thing about this, I'm going to put it on full screen for you, because, again, Matthew Cole, the sociologist, has pointed out, or he made something of the subtitle, Advocating Living Without Exploitation. They had that subtitle for quite a long time. And, again, it kind of, if you like, uh, indicates their kind of what you might call controversially a pro-intersectional uh, approach because it kind of echoed Watson's idea that veganism was about the uh, opposition to the exploitation of sentient life. So Cole mentions that in one of his articles about the vegan society. Now, in her article, Faye Henderson was responding to dire warnings emanating from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations on the food problem, which can be summarized with this dramatic line, the whole human race is rumbling to destruction. So again, you can't get more kind of dramatic uh, than that. She talks uh, in the article about food security issues. She talks about the transfer of feed uh, for so-called livestock, rather than providing food directly for humans, which again is a very kind of modern sounding kind of thing that you know we take away um, food from those without food, those humans without food, because you know, it's the usual thing about there's going to be many thousands of, of humans uh, without food this evening, but there won't be many farmed animals without food at all. So that's usually the thing. It's not that we don't have the food to feed them. It's just that we prefer to give it to livestock. So, so called. Okay, Rouge. <laughs> okay. And then she says, the solution to this problem lies in the homes of the people 
as in the organization of government. Now, this is really interesting thing when you think about when it, when it was said. I mean, we talk, we talk about 1948. This is almost like a commentary on something like Extinction Rebellion, you know, this kind of idea that it's all about this kind of, um, you know, kind of system change. She's basically saying you, you really need you really need bo both to occur. And um, I think a lot of people would um, would agree with that, you know. So the um, the problem lies in our homes in terms of our choices and our consuming and that kind of stuff, as well as in the kind of larger kind of structures of society. A crucial part of the solution to the food problem from a vegan point of view is to eliminate what was then called dairy and stock farming. <clears throat> and um, Henderson declares that as unnecessary, extravagant and cruel. And here she turns to a concern of many of the vegan movement pioneers, which was the state of the soil um, involving the art of cultivating the soil. And she concludes by saying that um, give and take is a good rule in all phases of life. And it especially applies to our relationship with the soil. So Faye Henderson was an admirer of a botanist called Albert Howard. And he was a pioneer of organic uh, gardening. So this is he. I'll put that again on, on full screen for you to have a quick look at. She had traveled to meet him actually in his wartime home and paid tribute to him in the pages of the vegan magazine after his death. And she was particularly impressed by the fact that he said that uh, food needs to be grown in healthy, naturally balanced soil. So it's really interesting, this kind of concern about the soil, which was a common, common theme amongst the vegan movement pioneers. Dr. Samantha Calvert, the head of communications at the Vegan Society, reports that the society had turned its attention to the practicalities of bringing about a vegan world as early as 1947. So we're only three years in and already they're starting to think big, uh, if you like. That would then uh, mean the growth of what we now know as vegan philosophy, but it also meant that they were starting to think in terms of, um, you know, how can, we, how can we help people who maybe want to... Um, join us but also and this is a very kind of early version of this they were interested in farmers who wanted to transition so um, this sheet is from uh, an article called ripened by human determination it's part of the history of the movement section of the vegan society website and um, this is really interesting he says um, the war agricultural executive committee waec seem to have an iron grip on farming in the post-war years. And in particular, they could con uh, take control of any farms that they deemed to be inefficient. So again, this is all part of the kind of post-war um, kind of situation. The once held passion for gardening of the, yeah, well, interesting. There are still some people with organic uh, allotments. I, I know a couple of people. But um, they're not influencers, <laughs> shall we say that? They, they're of, of an older generation. So we've got the case of Mrs. M. W. Austin Goodman. And she is a Welsh farmer and runs her own farm in Wales. And she contacted the vegan mag. And Faye was the editor at the time. So Austin Goodman was a vegetarian farmer. And she was running a farm that produced oats, wheat, and dairy. Uh, but she wanted to get rid of the dairy because she was thinking strongly about, about vegan ethics and everything. The problem was, and going back to this government thing that could just close her down at a minute's notice, is that the dairy element of the farm was the most profitable. And so she then uh, had a problem. Uh, she'd begun to take veganism seriously, as I said, but. She was almost like financially couldn't kind of do it. So how could she keep her farm and eliminate her main source of income on moral grounds? And so Henderson, as far back as 1947, 
said that the vegan society needs to work out something for farmers such as this in order that they can help such people. You know, she talked she talked about bringing about a workable scheme that could help farmers such as this one. Now, sadly, I don't know the the end of the story about whether they were able to help her, the farmer, or not. Uh, but they were aware that they probably needed to, uh, to that extent. So that was quite quite a good thing. I hear people daily tell farmers to stop farming. The one percent uh, of those people who offer solutions or assistance to make any transition is a fraction, and mostly is down to lack of info. Yeah, well, it's it's the one form really of political fo uh, campaigning that I think is possibly worthwhile. Uh, and even now, in the sense that um, uh, you know, we've we've got to. I mean, first of all, <laughs> I think the the first job about um, helping um, farmers uh, transition is to understand the subsidy system. And as far as I know, the subsidy system is like economics; it's very difficult to actually understand what it's all about. And you know, where you're you're posting from there, Andy, the, the in Britain. Well, obviously, Brexit is going to cause extra difficulties for you. Where I am in Dublin, we're still part of the European community. So that would mean that we would need to understand how the subsidy system works on a European wide uh, level and see what kind of what kind of pressure could be brought in order to help farmers, you know, because as we know from our TikTok discussions, the real problem for a lot of farmers is the startup costs. Thinking about the startup costs, I mean, they're 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 looking at their dairy farm, as it were, and probably thinking, "Wow, you know, if I was to strip all that away and start again, look how much that would cost." And then they think, "Okay, well, if I go for vertical farming, well, again, I'd, I'd have a whole new startup cost uh, problem." And so that's where the subsidies is going to have to play a, a role. So Henderson uh, did quite a few talks, as I mentioned. She did cookery demonstrations in Edinburgh, and she did talks in Dublin and Belfast. Uh, she did say, actually, that the, or at least it's reported, that the, um, the the Dublin one was well attended. The Irish were a little bit behind in terms of their understanding of veganism, but they were um, that they they were uh, kind of attentive and uh, a good audience, as it were. And again, what tended to happen is that when she did these talks, she would do it through the vegetarian societies or the regional ones or the local ones. So once once again, you'd, um, you know, you get uh, you get this thing that she needed to, to, to remain in contact with the with the vegetarians. Um, I've got a note here. One, this is the the vegan Q and A. I don't know what that means. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, let me just see if there's a slide that I'm not understanding. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, she also ran this thing called Po Pure in um, in the vegan, and people basically kind of um, write in saying, "Well, you know, um, I can't get this, so what do you think? And you know, can, can I get a, a vegan version of that and all this kind of stuff?" And it's interesting here. You do see. A generational difference here because the the it wasn't you know in those days it wasn't the way it is now where you can virtually replicate anything uh, that you like and essentially she kind of says um so it's, it's a little bit like uh, the uh, the lyrics of that rolling stone song you can't always get what you want and she was basically saying look you'll we'll never be able to have fluffy cakes like the non-vegans it's just a fact of life and so we we have to put up with it kind of thing and, and so in those days, a lot of people were asking, but the answer to it was, well, at this time, it can't be done. So again, for modern day vegans watching this, things are pretty different now and much better in that sense. Um, so that's um, that's a kind of good final lesson to take from, from this in the sense that it just goes to show how things have moved, if only on the dietary side of, of things. Right, so uh, as promised, this was a relatively short uh, time tunnel. So that was the second of our powerful women. Let me just have a quick look at the 
some of the comments. There's also tons of money within the movement. Well, yeah, that's interesting. It could be used like loans. Yeah, rebate. Yep, that that's right. Yep, that is that is a very good point in the sense that um, when you think about the duplication that goes on in this movement, and you think where it could go, I mean, um, how many how many vertical farms can be could be set up with uh, a million pounds that allegedly we can give to the Pope? Um, so um, that would um, that would be an interesting thing to to actually. We almost like need to do a financial audit of this movement because there is a lot of waste and there has been for a long time. I became aware of that when I was um, a committee member of one of the national groups down in London. And I suddenly realized that at the time, I think there was five different, this is just Britain, five different anti-view section organizations. And then that was added to by other ones like Uncaged. And so in that sense, uh, like Peter, for example, they could pay for thousands of farms to transition. Yeah, that, that, well, that is true. Uh, two, uh, not to mention that Peter have actually just got a lot of money just sat there, as it were, doing nothing as well. So, yeah, um, it, it would be a really interesting use of thinking about the movement's money in, in the practicalities of, you know, really helping other animals. And if you could help farmers to move away from committing rights violations on other animals and farming in the vegan way, then th there's not much better than that, right? And so given the fact that there is a lot of money slushing around in the movement, and given the fact that there's a lot of duplication that goes on, then you would have thought that if we really want to move this movement on, then you know some kind of, um, some kind of scrutiny of where the money is, what is it being used for, what what is the justification for all the duplication and i've never really been able to see any certainly not now in the internet age there used to be certain ad, um arguments that you could have about the reason why you would need you know some power bases dotted around the country as it were but in the age of the internet those those arguments are not very good hi deb uh, the f uh, the afa agricultural fairness alliance here in the usa is assisting in transitioning farmers. I wonder whether Howard, um, you know, um, my friend, <laughs> I forgot his name, oh no. <laughs> uh, it, you know, so that, you know, we're talking about farm kind. So uh, yeah, Harold Brown, sorry, sorry, Harold, if you ever get to watch this, I do apologize for forgetting your name. Um, but um, I mean, he, he's been doing that for 25 years, helping uh, farmers, helping with things like the paperwork, helping get through all the kind of bureaucracy of government, uh, you know, kind of selling selling one thing and buying another, all, all those kind of things. So th those are really kind of practical things that the vegan movement could do. And as we've seen from this time tunnel, that impulse goes all the way back to 1948. So it's amazing, really, that the vegans were already thinking about it, you know, that long ago. And, you know, our movement obviously is much richer now, you know. Uh, do the vegan society help all countries or only in the in Britain? I don't I don't know the question to that. I, I don't know whether they um, they used to be the vegan society used to be, fun enough, a member of the International Vegetarian Union, but I'm not even sure that exists anymore. And also uh, whether they would still be in it if if it did, I I, I can't really answer that question. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've got a globalized problem. We need a globalized movement, which allegedly we have. We the, the money in the movement is globalized. There's plenty of it. So it would be an interesting project to kind of go, OK, let's move on to the practicalities of helping the farmers. And I suppose one thing on the psychological level there is that we've got to see stop seeing farmers as just the enemy. In, this, in the sense that it's not as though we're going to fire all the farmers and hire new farmers in their place. What we're looking for is, is what some of them are doing now, which is going, I made a mistake, don't want to do this anymore, and I'd like to transition. But it's the same people. You know, three years ago, they were running a dairy farm. Now, now they've got a veganic farm. So it's the same people. So it's not as though we should demonize them uh, in that sense. So there you go. Right, people. So um, 
I think we're just about done. So I shall say thank you for tuning in. Um, if you know anybody who's interested in the history of the movement, then do um, point them towards my YouTube channel and in particular the uh, playlist uh, Rogers Vegan, I think it's called Vegan Time Channel or Rogers Vegan Time Channel. So people, take care and I'll see you uh, next week. Hey, Earthlings, <laughs> how are you doing? Um, welcome along to another vegan uh, time tunnel. As you probably know by now, we're putting together an archive of some interesting historical um, issues within the animal uh, movement. Let's call, call it that, animal protection, advocacy. Um, there's different names, obviously, uh, for it. I'm accompanied today by a very feisty cat so expect some disruption i would think i i am at least um also shortly after this particular time tunnel there is a, a special uh, premiere of the director's cut of um, andy atkinson's film which is called animal rights we're getting it wrong um which is really good and i'm not saying that because um, i'm in it um I seem, to, I seem to be in it a lot at the beginning, but, but then that's because he's cut, cut my bit up um, a few times. So it just makes it look as though I'm more in it than I am, I think. Anyway, we're um, back to celebrating the powerful female members of uh, the pioneers of the vegan social movement. And we're into uh, the 50s, late 50s, and into the 60s. Now, this is really interesting from the movement's point of view. Um, in the sense that there is um, a sense now that we are starting to see the vegan movement starting its process of moderation uh, in terms of um, a movement away from uh, radicalism. So <clears throat> we'll we'll get into that. Um, but for now, welcome to the time tunnel. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I call this little kind of mini series within within the time tunnel uh, the founding mothers or uh, strong female members. Um, obviously, we've got this kind of gender uh, problem in a way that most uh, spokespersons were are the one the ones that people know historically or right now are usually men. Um, you know, so we, this is this is a problem for social movements in general, but it's been a problem in our movement in particular, because throughout history, most people in our movement, or our movements, if you want to talk about animal rights, animal welfare, anti vivisection for example, most people have been uh, women. So there's always that kind of issue, uh, if you like. So uh, Eva Batt was born in uh, 1908 and died in 89, so died at the age of 81. Now, she played quite a significant role in the development of uh, the vegan society. She was a member, um, she was serving member of, um, of the society as chairperson for 15 years. She was also the society's vice president uh, for a while. And one of her most significant uh, contributions was editing something called the commodity pages of the vegan. And she did that for over 20 years. So we'll come back to the details of that because some of it is, is pretty kind of interesting. The society were the publishers of her two fairly famous uh, cookbooks. Uh, at least um, in, for my generation of vegans, um, everybody had uh, Eva Batts cookbooks. So you got um, What's Cooking? And then there was, I can't really find the um, the original, it was What Else is Cooking? But I think they, those two got subsumed into the things on the screen there. You see vegan cookery and the updated one, 
uh, which has obviously got a much more modern appearance to the right there. What's Cooking is one of those books where, you know, it was kind of um, laminated kind of pages, you know, and so it was designed to to open up uh, there and then when you're cooking uh, and because you can wipe the pages down. So everybody had uh, What's Cooking. It was very kind of fairly kind of famous um, book of, of, of uh, the time, my generation, as I said. She was also a um, council member of the American uh, Vegan Society. So that, that's interesting in the sense that there was a different set of claims makers from the American group. They were more into talking about things like ahimsa, which they defined as dynamic harmlessness. So that's quite kind of interesting uh, in many ways. She was also a director of Plamil, and they began selling canned soya milk, um, the concentrated version, in 1965. She also worked for Beauty Without Cruelty. Uh, whenever I, I hear that uh, the name of that group, I, I can't f forget the fact that they used to sell these kind of fake fur coats or faux fur coats. And, um, but they used to sell them with a really big badge, absolutely ridiculously sized badge that people used to wear, which said, said make no mistake, my fur is fake. Um, so that's what I remember of Beauty Without uh, Cruelty. She also owned a shop that sold vegan friendly food, clothing and footwear. So she was very active in her time. The first time she appears in the Vegan Society's committee in the listing is 1958. And here we see um, that. I'm going to put that on, on full screen. Now, it's not particularly well reproduced, so you probably won't be able to read uh, much of it. One significant part of this, actually, though, is you'll see that the vegan on the left, the magazine or the journal, um, so that's that's where we first encounter uh, Eva Bat. This is winter 1958. Um, but if you see the one uh, on the right there, we can just see the top part of it. It had that strap line, which the sociologist um, Matthew Cole pointed out, um, advocating living without exploitation. So that had kind of gone by the, by the late 1950s. So again, what we might be seeing uh, from a, a social movement point of view or from the point of view of the social movement organization known as the Vegan Society is that this might be part of the process of uh, moderation. Now, one person who's talked about moderation within social movements a lot is sociologist Corrie Lee Wren talked about social movement professionalization. And the idea of becoming professionalized kind of sounds good, but it's got pros and cons. First of all, it becomes much more organized, but then the typical um, pattern is that these organizations then start to de-radicalize. And that means that they're moderate, more moderate in terms of what they say and often uh, what they do. And so um, Curry explores this idea in a couple of books, but also this journal, Gen uh, Journal of uh, Gender Studies. And she argues that it's rather necessary, a necessary drawback uh, to professionalism is the moderation in goals and in organization. And they must appeal to a larger constituency to support a larger overhead. And so what's that alluding to is that part of the professionalization process is when you end up getting um, things like uh, staff, uh, buildings, offices, physical offices, and that kind of thing. And she also says, uh, quickly won victories are essential for the professionalized organization's fundraising obligations. So this is um, something that is a problem uh, for this movement in particular, in, in the sense that that tends to mean that um, there almost like needs to be a whole series of victories announced every now and again to kind of keep people subscribing to, to your organization, uh, essentially. So that scene, I mean, this is social movement theory, um, and it kind of applies to all social movements, but it certainly applies to the, the animal movement, that if you don't um, 
if you don't kind of announce a victory every now and again, then you could have a kind of problem, um, if you like. So again, this kind of idea that there might have been some kind of um, move towards welfareism uh, comes out in some of the things that the vegan social movement started publishing in by 1958. For example, this manifesto of animal rights um, is quite interesting. Um, it's very kind of welfareist in tone. Um, if you see the panel to the right there, it says basic principles. Some of those are quite interesting. Life uh, is uh, a oneness, these kind of ideas. Unity is good, this kind of thing. But then there's a lots of cruelty talk. Cruelty is indivisible, uh, those kind of things. And then when you get down to what's called the manifesto for animal rights, it's kind of anything but really. Um, number one, for the present purposes, the term animal covers all forms of sentient life. And then they contradict themselves straight away in number two. Cruelty to animals shall be defined as any act that a human uh, being towards an animal. And so they, they first say that all other animals are, uh, or all animals are involved, and then they, they make a distinction between humans and other animals, uh, which caused um, that animal to endure physical or mental pain, uh, which is not for the benefit of that particular animal. Now, this is kind of RSPCA type stuff, which, which is interesting, really, because in most countries, animal welfare laws, there is a recognition that other animals can suffer both physically and also psychologically. So in other words, there's um, lines like, you shouldn't terrorize um, other animals, this kind of stuff. And so there's this kind of recognition of, of a mental life within animal welfare legislation that often people will reject as though you know other animals are, are not quite there then uh, number three is quite interesting in the sense that it's all about um, the kind of limitations of what they're calling animal rights, which really is animal welfare. All animals shall uh, normally have the right to, lie, uh, to live out their lives according to their natural expectation of life, provided 3A, they do not attack human life when man shall have the right to self-defense, 3B, they are not pests, so that opens up a, a whole bag of um, uh, possibilities. When man shall have the right to defend himself. 3C, when an animal uh, in pain, so we're talking about um, shall be put down, interesting language, of course. And then uh, 3D, when man would otherwise die of starvation. So it's kind of a very kind of um, heavily curtailed idea of what we would understand as uh, animal rights uh, in, in this day and age. Another thing that was part and parcel of the late 50s society was the crusade against all cruelty to animals. Now this, as far as I'm aware, this is an organization which be some, somehow became affiliated with the, the vegan society. Uh, and so, um, so Margaret Cooper here kind of appears quite often in the vegan journal at this time, uh, giving accounts of um, of this particular kind of um, crusade, uh, uh, as she calls it, which is quite interesting. One one thing that's interesting about this is that towards the bottom, um, yeah, it talks about humanitarians. So I, I want to say a couple of things ab about that uh, in a while. But they they also talk about um, film meetings. So it's quite interesting, you know, like we tend to think of of kind of like. Uh, evenings full of film have been a rather a new thing but they would talk about film meetings one of which they report right at the bottom there um in support of the vegan society at our kensington meeting on september the 30th which was attended by 500 people so that's a pretty good attendance i think we'd be pretty well pleased if we organized a, a film meeting uh, today and we had 500 people in attendance so in terms of moderation then, um, well, first of all, this is the movement that Eva Bat had, had come into. And so she began to be active when this potential moderation had started to occur. And so you end up getting socialized by the movement that you join, of course. So 
This is only 14 years after the foundation of the vegan society. Uh, but kind of worse than that, it's only three, four, five years after all the writings of Leslie Cross, who was writing about vegan philosophy over a number of years, starting something like 49 and finishing around about uh, 55. And when, when he said things like veganism was on the side of the, the liberators, it's not about welfare, uh, it's not about cruelty, it's about abolition, it's not about making things better, it's about abolition of use and this kind of thing. And so there is, seems to be a, a distinct um, change in tone, um, really. And I think that um, the next slide might kind of start to point to why this might be. Let me just alter that so you can see it, although I'm not sure you won't be able to read it very well. This is 1959 at this stage. So Eva Bat was producing news items for the vegan, the Journal of the Society, and news items from all over the world. And again, you have to say that most of these were welfareist um, in nature. And it talks about those involved with animal welfare. Uh, all this kind of language is, is kind of replete throughout, throughout this period. And just speculating on this, I tend to think that this is possibly because the society now has found its feet as a social movement organization. And it started to become known. It started to make contacts on a global level. And so it starts to feature news from its, as it were, allies and contacts um, from all over the world. And all, all of that is kind of welfare based in, in nature, which they're reproducing in the magazine. And so there, there is this kind of problem, I think, that there's the potential um, to, uh, to move towards moderation, again, comes from the potential towards things like um, professional, professionalization, becoming established and this kind of stuff. And I think this is probably uh, kind of what's going on uh, here. Okay, I'm going to uh, switch tack in a sense uh, because um, a lot of the work that Eva Bat got involved with was um, about food labeling and about trying to find out which foods were vegan friendly, which then could be reported in the journal uh, obviously, this is well before the age of the internet and everything. So, if you look at if you look at this, for example, now this is interesting. This is the University of Reading in Britain, and it's kind of like a, a, a bit of a history of food labeling law. And as you can see, there probably on the left, 1943 is where it starts. It kind of goes in reverse order, so we don't really need to look at the details of this. But virtually every year sometimes more than once a year, there was something that came through, okay, right up to the 1970s. Uh, and that was to do when Britain entered the European or the common market, uh, as it was called. In those days, there's, there's, even, there's even issues coming through to the 1990s um, in this. Now, the interesting part of it is the fact that a lot of these regulations were to do with um, people being conned. In fact, there's a little summary here. So the, the very earliest um, moves towards the regulation of labeling came in 1938. And it says here about um, made it offense to sell a food or a drug uh, which had a label which falsely describes that food or drug or is otherwise calculated to mislead as to its nature, substance or quality. Unless the seller was able to demonstrate that he did not know that the label was incorrect. Just says the label incorrect there. I think it's a typo. So, so this is what we, we've, we've, we've got going on. And of course, the, the, the issue for vegans is the fact that um, all this legislation doesn't necessarily mean that um, manufacturers had to specify in very careful terms all the ingredients. And so uh, what the vegans were left doing really was to write to the manufacturers. Uh, in order to do this. In fact, those who've seen Ronnie Lee talk about this, even when he went vegan in 1972, he said that the label labeling then was still pretty dodgy to the, to the extent that um, all the vegans were, were eating a peanut butter, which ended, ended up having so-called beef fat um, in it. And so 
it could really be a kind of problem for vegans. And so in that sense, um, Eva Bat took on this kind of task, if you like. And she did a lot of writing to manufacturers in, all, in order to establish whether their products were vegan friendly. And she became known as the commodities investigator of the Vegan Society. Um, and let me just see this one. Uh, this is this is the um, the item that was at the top of, of each of of the journal's um, uh, commodities kind of uh, pages. All the following commodities are free of uh, animal content, and we have the insur assurance of the manufacturers that they do not come into contact with animal substances during processing. So all all the kind of issues and worries that we might have as modern vegans were were being were being um rehearsed here this was the time when um animal charcoal was being used to process white sugar which is no longer the case um in britain and i don't think in in much of europe uh, probably all of it i'm not quite sure and so there was there was quite a lot um going on if i go if i go back you, you can see all the, all the different or i don't know if you can see them uh, but there's all the different manufacturers there being contacted, including Kellogg's, and you know all all these all these these groups. And it's interesting because they're some of them are saying, well, it's we, we've got labels. Others are saying, well, no, we can assure you, even though we don't have labels and, and and this kind of stuff. So it was a kind of big deal for the vegans at the time to find out what the vegan friendly um, items were for, for kind of obvious reasons. Um, now, this one is, uh, let me find out where this one is. This is winter 1959. And so Eva Bat, the commodities investigator, is still busy. And um, she produces an eight-page um, Christmas special um, for this um, issue. And so what, what they're suggesting is, is, that, um, is that each time it, the journal came out, which was four times a year, that that these sections were pulled out and put into a separate file and therefore would end up being a kind of database for each and every member. And so they actually put the commodities pages in the middle of the journal so they could be removed without doing any, you didn't have to rip them out, you could actually just unstaple it and then staple it again. So the idea was for, uh, for, for people to make up their own kind of database. And of course later, that developed into things like the animal free shopper uh, and this kind of thing. So these are some of the concerns of uh, the movement in its kind of early years, in a sense, is the fact that they needed to be able to alert members to what was vegan friendly and what was not. Now, this is an interesting one in the sense that, um, let me put that out down to there. This is uh, the Christmas dinner part of this uh, commodities thing. And you'll see there that um, it's got Julien soup, uh, wholemeal rolls, uh, stuffed Brazil nut roast, gravy, chestnut balls, um, apple sauce, Brussels sprouts, braised carrots, roast potatoes, Christmas pudding, nut cream, mince pies, coffee, and homemade sweets. And then you've got the recipe for all of that uh, laid out um, in the... Um, uh, in the magazine. And so this is quite interesting. I mean, we're talking about the end of the 50s here. Britain is still subject to um, some forms of uh, rationing due to, due to the war years. And yet, you know, often vegans of a certain age will, will get that question. Oh, it must have been so difficult back then. And as you can see, there are some things that uh, were available. And we've... Um, Somebody said that they're hungry. Thanks, Roger. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go and make yourself a Christmas. Um, go and make yourself a Christmas dinner, um, uh, Graham. I'm sure it won't cause any problems. Now, let me just take my cushion down because that was my cat defence, but I don't think I need it now. Uh, also, um, the brown, the brown gravy <laughs> is part of the recipe, which I thought was was quite good. For those people who know me, you know that I'm a big uh, goons fan. And uh, Eccles from the Goons always uh, maintained that he likes chips with brown uh, gravy. So, so the vegans the vegans had everything in, in a sense. Now, 
just before we get the impression that all the early vegans did was stuff their faces, there is a lot more going on in terms of their correspondence, um, if you like, with the powers that be at the time. So if we move into the 1960s, for example, um, Eva Black wrote to the honorary secretary, oh, no, sorry, she wrote as the honorary secretary of the Vegan Society to the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Fisheries and Food, which was based in London at the time, probably still is, which uh, was considering yet more recommendations and regulations for food labeling. So she, um, she sent a letter, which was effectively a list of the demands from the vegan world. And if it came to pass, it would have radically shaken up the entire food industries. Uh, for example, this was one of the things that she, um, she said. Uh, but argued that the word milk should be used in its technical sense, i.e. as a term for the emulsified liquid, as in vegetable milk, coconut milk, uh, latex milk, etc., etc., and therefore not used necessarily to denote cow's milk only. Now, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Because there's still these big debates and fights going on between industry and the kind of plant-based industry, if you like, uh, with relation to, you know, who can use words like milk um, and that. And so that's still going on uh, throughout the world, really. She goes on, uh, butter likewise should be referred to as either nut butter or cow butter. Now, I love the I love the idea of um, uh, them having to label it cow butter, which which would be quite an interesting kind of development, um, in a sense. I, I always I always tell people that um, you know cow cow milk is calf food, but um, it would be good to reference cow butter, I suppose. Another fairly brilliant labeling demand was that all uh, food containing animal milk or cream, cow butter or cheese made from animal milk, should be clear uh, should clearly state uh, that on the label. And he, she said all foods containing eggs, whether or not intensively produced, which, which is which is good, should also be clearly marked. And so this was um, the vegans trying to make an impact on the ongoing labeling um, regulations that were going on um, in Britain. So that was the demands. And of course, not none of you watching or listening to this will be surprised that none of these vegan demands were um, ever met. Um, and so uh, it was the, the vegans were blanked on it, essentially. More generally, she asked about releasing humanity from animal husbandry, which would result in a country such as Britain becoming a next exporter of foodstuff, which is a very kind of early uh, vegan society uh, argument that um, in a vegan world, virtually every country would probably become a uh, food exporter rather than an importer. And so not only was she wanting the government to really crack down on the labeling of, um, of foods with um, animal derived ingredients, as it were, she actually wanted them to close down the animal um, agriculture industry in the name of um, food security for the country. And she also wrote, uh, again, 65, or oh, 64, sorry, um, why a vegan? And um, she she was uh, again arguing that uh, just just think what a vegan world would would um, would mean for what she described as undeveloped, and then she also put in brackets another term for starving peoples in the world, and what a contribution it would make towards world peace. So um, I often feature a um, a, a particular. Um, quote from why vegan which is which is coming up you won't be surprised but um it's it is an interesting uh, document this one there is quite a lot of cruelty language in it but you've also got some of the what i would argue are um elements of the scope of, of vegan philosophy uh, coming into it th th this one um being uh, one and uh, as we see when we get to uh, the next uh, female pioneer, um, <clears throat> Kathleen Janaway, 
they took seriously the idea that a vegan world would mean the end of war and would mean the end of poverty. They, 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 they took that fairly seriously. And um, here you can see Eva Bat articulating a similar kind of um, idea. She also said, aside from immediate effects, vegans consider this way of life to be no less a duty to future generations. It will make, uh, take many ages at the present rate of progress to undo all the results of past wrongs, if indeed this is ever possible. And whatever our, our actions, it is our heirs even more than we who will reap the results, good or bad, of what we do today, tomorrow, and the next day. Until we leave them, what? A desert, a conflagration, or a garden of a plenty. A conflagration is um, is destruction by fire. So it's really interesting in the in the in the sense that they felt um, a desire, uh, and we've got to remind ourselves that these these people had um, you know just come out of uh, a global conflict, and um, good or bad, yes. Well, yeah, that's right. It's kind of, um, you know, uh, in other words, the, the next gen generation will have to deal with, with the results of, of what we do now, good or bad, right? And so she's suggesting that we should do good in order to, to leave them something worth leaving. Um, I think that is the, the argument. Okay, also in Why Veganism, the pamphlet from 1964, Eva Bat wrote in it what remains as one of the most powerful uh, assertions of vegan values. And this, for those who have seen my presentation before, uh, will know this uh, particularly well. Veganism is one thing and one thing only, a way of living which avoids exploitation, whether it be of our fellow men, the animal population, or the soil upon which we rely uh, for our very existence. Now, it's really interesting this in in the sense that um i said that there seems to be some movements toward moderation and yet here here in the 1960s uh, eva bat is remaining kind of faithful to the language of the earliest pioneers when they talk about exploitation which they meant use and so uh, avoids use and then you've got again the scope of veganism being articulated, uh, whether it be of our fellow men, the animal population, or the soil upon which uh, we rely. And so, again, there's this kind of um, intertwining of, of issues, which was part of the, of the vegan uh, scope, um, I would suggest. Um, this last bit always creates some concern or comment. Um, like the other movement pioneers, uh, either about would often talk a good deal about the soil. Um, she talked about it in terms of, of the correct balance, um, in terms of its conservation, and as part of the correct long-term use of the land. So that, that was a particular interest uh, to vegans. And you'll see next time that Kathleen Janaway was in particular very concerned ab about these issues. I always say that this issue came back into the movement in the 1980s with the publication of a very influential book by John Robbins, which is called Diet for a New America, where he, he talked about topsoil and topsoil erosion, these kind of issues, and about how um, you know there, there is just this thin layer of, of soil separating rock from sky, essentially. And without it, we can't survive. Uh, and yet we do incredible amounts of damage to it. And they were concerned about that uh, way way back into the 50s and the 1960s. Bat was concerned that her generation of vegans needed to ensure that they protect the soil to, as it were, hand it over to the next generation. And they wanted to hand it over as a valuable heritage. Um, and they... They wanted it to be not eroded or scorched or leached of its essential minerals, which are so necessary for a full and healthy life, uh, she wrote. 
it's interesting this idea of of, of being concerned about handing over uh, you know a good planet essentially to the next generation um i suppose that she didn't know that future generations and our generation would be much more ignorant of these issues than their generation uh, was i mean now we kind of act as though we don't care much about anything but consuming things whereas they were really concerned with issues of conservation over generations they they were thinking of and you don't tend to get um that um you know that kind of sense of things uh, nowadays um the role and hard work of the women pioneers was clearly as important um as the men in the movement and again this is bittersweet perhaps in practical terms perhaps more so the the women did end up doing cookery demonstrations and um you know doing the writing as it were to the uh, the ministries etc to find out the vegan friendly stuff and so there there is again that kind of gender divide which is very kind of stereotypical um, i suppose uh the women were it, it invariably given the job of researching the food suitable for vegans as i've said and managing and running of cookery demonstrations um up and down the country uh which they did to great effect in, in actual fact so um so they they did that job well but it's quite interesting from a, a feminist point of view that it was primarily the women who, who did that although on retirement uh, leslie cross did uh, go around the country but that was on a kind of lecture tour rather than a cookery um demonstration tour so again i suppose that's just a reproduction of that uh, gender issue right i'm going to finish off with um about three minutes of um film from the uh, recently enhanced um, version of um, Open Door. Now, Open Door is a really interesting uh, historical document. It, it looks incredibly dated when you see it. Um, it was produced in 1976. Um, as, as Ronnie Lee said in a recent program, um, he watched this when it went out. In fact, this is one of, one of the big things that, 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 that nailed kind of veganism down for a lot of people around around him at the time. He'd been vegan uh, for, for a few years by then. But he said in terms of the language, which we're going to find a bit amusing, this was just the language of the BBC in those days. So what had happened essentially was the BBC had, had said to social organisations, well, look, if you want to promote your yourself, we'll come along with all our equipment you, you can say what you want and we'll just film it and help you with the editing and all the rest of it. And so that's what the open door thing, uh, as it were, is all about. So it's really kind of interesting um, in that sense. There was a previous one uh, for the Hunt Saboteurs in this series, which ended up being a big recruitment tool. Ronnie says that um, many, many vegans um, joined the movement or many people kind of, as it were, went vegan on the, on the basis of this particular um, uh, program which was only well, it's about 28 minutes long so i've got a three minute clip which features eva bat to end with so here we go the vegan society was formed in 1944. let's face it erica cow's milk is for calves not for humans yes and we have other athletes in our society too, like Jack McClelland, a wrestler, footballer, and cross-channel swimmer. And they all agree that milk is a baby food, not fit for strong men. Eva Bat. Eva is chairman of our vegan council. Tell us, Eva, how you became a vegan. I remember very clearly, Erica. Well, that was nearly 20 years ago. There was this railway station platform, and there were some cows herded at one end, and they were making a very pathetic noise. And at the other end were baby calves, very, very young, and they too were crying for the mother cows. And of course, I asked an official, why couldn't they be put together? And he explained that the cows were going to market, and the calves were coming to the butcher. To the butcher, I said. Why? Well, he said, you can't have milk 
unless cows keep having calves. And you can only rear a few of those calves as cows. Most of those other poor little things have been real and hand by before long. This shook me. I hadn't realised that uh, milk production was responsible for all this suffering and slaughter. I had pictured placid, gentle cows happily grazing in green pastures, and I thought how kind the farmers were to relieve them of their milk. I turned again to the cows, because one was nudging my shoulder, trying to attract my attention. And as I turned, she gave straight into my eyes, and there was a real message. That's the time it came through to me. I knew then I could never drink milk again. And I hadn't. But believe me, I had a terrible time over that weekend, just wondering how I was going to manage. I knew people could live well without meat, but without milk, I really thought I was going to die. So you can imagine how delighted I was when I discovered that there were other people who were living happy, healthy lives as vegans, thinking the way I did. And today, on my 68th birthday, I am feeling, I too, I should say, I'm feeling happier, healthier, and altogether better than ever before. So, um, how many times are we going to see those scenes? I mean, that, that those scenes there were, were um, filmed in the 1970s. And we've seen it over and over, generations later, uh, separation of mother and child, with the mother following, um, presumably not knowing what to do. I don't know whether you actually picked up on this, but the, the young, young guy of the two kept glancing back at the mother and that's possibly because he probably knew that sometimes the mothers get a little bit defensive and, you know, might actually attack them, which we've again seen um, in subsequent films, because they're having their babies taken away from them, you know, and that happens over and over. And then farmers have the gall to say, oh, well, you know, uh, some mothers are not very good mothers. How, how, many, how many babies would a human mother need to have taken away from them? And there's an Irish film where the farmer used the phrase snatched, uh, that the newborn calf was snatched from the mother. How, how many b before you stop be, be, you know, being a good mother? So that is a very kind of modern part of the, the film. I know it's got that kind of very, very dated uh, look about it. At the same time, that scene, you, you could go and film that tomorrow at a dairy farm because it's always the same and it's always, you know, completely pitiful. The separation of a mother from a child, probably one of the most horrible things that anybody could do and to do it repeatedly uh, and for profit is just pretty disgusting. Okay, uh, vegan rant over from me. So that, um, that folks is your uh, vegan time tunnel and um, yeah, and he says, 50 years later, and we're still stealing babies. Um, the movement seems to be uh, full of strong women from the foundation. Uh, they just don't get some of the attention or accolades that some of the men do. Yeah, that's right. I guess that's still a societal issue uh, we must address. 
it, it's it's a social issue that is um, repeat repeated everywhere. When when I when I kind of dabbled in um, academia and when I was kind of running things like seminars and stuff, you always had to manage them on gendered lines in the sense that it, it was very regular for men or a couple of men to kind of uh, dominate the session and and you kind of really had to be a, a gatekeeper and said okay any anyone else and it was very common to to get kind of gobby guys and silent women and it's really uh, unfortunate now obviously that's a stereotype and it doesn't apply to everyone but it was pretty common um, in my experience and then when i became a lecturer and other people did the uh, the seminar part of it they had the same kind of problem and so we had to try to devise uh, ways of trying to encourage um the women in the group to contribute because they they were almost constrained by the culture essentially patriarchy i think it's called correct me if uh, if i'm wrong okay people um Oh, right, another one. Um, I remember reading an activist, albeit she was representing Peter. You you, you had to make me say that word, didn't you? I, I, yeah, okay. Um, say, no, uh, nobody paid any attention to me until I went uh, out in my... Yes, right, that's right. And I think that really demonstrates just how broken uh, it all is. Well, uh, I mean, the recent Peter thing involved um, a 40 uh, or a, an actor, a female actor in her 40s who took her clothes off, usual thing. And she did a, a publicity video for Peter explaining why she did it. And she basically said, well, look, I have to take my clothes off, otherwise no, nobody's going to take any notice of me. So e even now in the 21st century, that's still sadly uh, the same. And it's just an indictment uh, still of the values of um, society still dominated by the ideology of uh, patriarchy, which for a group like Peter is, excuse my language, boils down to get your tits out for the animals, unfortunately. But that's been their thing for many, many years, uh, sadly. And it's been one of the reasons why quite a lot of progressive people will shun our movement, because we don't seem to have the um, credentials uh, as a progressive social movement as far as they're concerned but that is a, an argument for elsewhere all right people thank you so much then for tuning in now a reminder that uh, in a few minutes time or um probably about 35 minutes i believe or maybe 30 minutes uh andy atkinson the the new vegan filmmaker uh is doing his director's cut of his first substantive film which is called animal rights we're getting it wrong i I had the pleasure of seeing it uh, last night and um, it's really good. And there's uh, about 15 minutes extra in it. Um, the editing is better on uh, Andy's new machine, which uh, which we're pleased to have been able to help um, buy for him because the production of the first film actually blew his 11 year old laptop out of the sky. And so we had to get him some equipment pretty sharpish, the movement uh, rallied round and now we have it and so you can expect a stream of content beginning this evening uh, with that uh, director's cut which is also enhanced and improved visually and um, and in terms of audio so I look forward to that and I look forward to seeing you all again uh, next week for another time tunnel so thanks a lot for tuning in Hey, Earthlings, welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a croaky uh, voice uh, today for some reason. Uh, also, I've um, had an email from StreamYard, uh, which is the platform that I'm streaming from, and uh, they've got some technical issues. So I don't know whether that means that I'm going to be a little bit uh, 
jittery or what, but uh, let's hope it doesn't get anything kind of worse <clears throat> than that. So, people, thanks very much for uh, tuning in. Um, as the regulars will know, we're putting together an archive of um, interesting uh, events and uh, people, etc., from the history of the vegan or the animal uh, movement. And today we've got the last, or at least one of the last, of the founding mothers, as I call them, the powerful women pioneers of the vegan social movement. So, um, so Kathleen Janaway uh, will be meeting today, looking at her, uh, her life and her work, which is all pretty uh, impressive, as you'll see. So, people, welcome then to the Vegan Time Tunnel. <laughs> to veganism is the most important thing we can do today to save all highly developed forms of life on this planet. We live at momentous times at what could be a terrific turning point in evolution. Nothing to my mind can exaggerate the importance of veganism. Yes, indeed. So uh, that was Kathleen Genoway, as I'm sure you won't be surprised. I'm just going to uh, knock a couple of things off here to try and help with the uh, the technological uh, issues. So that film clip there, and there, there will be a later one of the same thing. Um, it comes from 1992 and it was the sixth international vegan festival. And it's recently been enhanced by Andy Atkinson, our new famous uh, filmmaker on the block. And um, so you need to go to his YouTube channel if you want to see um, all of it. Um, oh, hi, Curry. Hello there. I'm glad you could make it. All right, let's see about this. Okay, so that is um, not your mum, spelt the English way, M-U-M, but it, the, then there's a dot. So not your mum dot, not your uh, not your milk, that's it. And so that's the YouTube channel. Uh, so I think there's about 88 enhanced videos now, which um, have a better uh, video quality, but in particular, there's a better audio quality. So it's well worth uh, having a look because we do realize in this day and age that if things are not particularly good in terms of production uh, quality, then there can be a problem. We'll encounter that uh, in a little uh, while, in fact. <clears throat> now, in the talk that I referenced there, um, Kathleen Janaway does talk about the importance of trees, which became, in the end, her main campaigning focus. And so this is when she switched from the Vegan Society to something called Movement for Compassionate Living, which is still online you can still find find their website okay so kathleen janaway was born in 1915 and she died in 2003 she's very fondly uh, remembered by a lot of people including someone called david graham who is the co-founder of this which is a, a journal growing green international it's kind of twice week uh, yearly and it's published by the vegan organic network uh which um Janaway seemed to have something to do with the foundation of or the expansion of in fact movement for compassionate living once got a legacy of eighty thousand pounds and uh, the first thing they did was give 75 70 000 pounds of it away to the vegan organic uh, network they were trying to create a center uh, and their, their aim was to promote veganism, nonviolence in farming, and a cooperative model for working. So David Graham writes this in um, an article called The Legacy of Kathleen Janaway. About 20 years ago, Jane and I, that's the co-founders of Vegan Organic Network, <coughs> went to a meeting in an ob obscure hall 
uh, in a back street in Glossop, uh, Derbyshire. I can't remember the title of the talk, but I remember the speaker, Kathleen Janaway. There was nothing grey about her. He, he talks about Glossop being rather grey, and I've been through through there often enough to know that that's true. Although she was uh, friendly and warm, there was fire and challenge in her manner and her delivery. And as usual with Janaway, she draws together all the threads that was kind of really part of um, the pioneers' uh, veganism um, at the time. So we're talking about themes about war and peace, injustice, social exclusion, uh, cruelty, animal rights, hunger, and consumerism. I would throw in animal exploitation to uh, to kind of uh, knock the edge off the cruelty bit, of course. Uh, he said her talk was informed, objective, but at the same time, passionate and moving. She talked about how food was grown and how the slaughterhouse, a house of slaughter, uh, is a symbol of repression. So that is kind of like really the, the stock kind of talk that uh, Janaway would deliver, bringing all these themes together. So in that sense, quite uh, impressively so. Uh, when she was the editor of The Vegan, the formal journal of the Vegan Society, she encouraged the development uh, and publication of vegan views. So um, these pictures are some of the early ones and then some of the, the later ones, if you like. Um, and it really is interesting because um, there was a lot of argument in the vegan society because their first magazines looked very much like these ones on the left. Uh, and then they started to use photography, which was controversial at the time. And it seems like the vegan views uh, have done that as well. So vegan uh, views was kind of more informal than the uh, official vegan journal. And it was designed really as a forum for discussion is obviously pre-internet and so therefore um you know it was important to be able to produce these kind of newsletters which essentially this was with some news um you know kind of added in i, I remember both the vegan news and the vegan society magazine of course in the radical bookshops of the 1980s so writing in vegan uh, views then at the time of kathleen janaway's death in 2003, Henry uh, Martha wrote this. She married Jack Janaway. They shared a radical outlook and seeking a fairer, uh, more caring world and became conscientious objectors during the war. They were also Quakers. It was a successful partnership with Jack, although uh, never prominent, was constant and reliable support in all of Kathleen's uh, work. During the war, whilst she was preparing a meager ration of lamb, but in rabbit ears, Kathleen heard a commotion outside and saw lambs uh, in the field, and in fact, a, a slaughterhouse truck too. They both uh, suddenly made the connection and became vegetarians. In 1964, Kathleen read a review of the book Animal Machines by Ruth Harris. She then made the connection between milk production and the need to slaughter superfluous male calves. Uh, once she became a vegan, in 1971, having raised three children, she took over as secretary of the Vegan Society and dedicated her mind and energy to the vegan cause. So even, even with these tributes, we can see that um, Kathleen Janaway's life and her work was very important in terms of the history of the vegan uh, social movement. So as I said above then, uh, she was born in 1915 and died in 2003 at the age of 87. She had uh, working class origins and it was these working class values of her parents and, grand and grandparents that were to shape her radical vision of the future and that future for her eventually went, meant a, a vegan future. So she campaigned first uh, for the Vegan Society as its general secretary uh, and editor of the, the magazine. Uh, that was from the 1970s. And then from 84 onwards, 
was a co-founder of the Movement for Compassionate Living that I mentioned before. And as I said, he's still up on online. I think, I think the actual base of that is now in Wales, as far as I remember. She, she left the Vegan Society, and there's some controversy about how and why, but she left really because she wanted to concentrate on eco-veganism, ecological veganism, it was called at the time. And if you watch the, um, the film I mentioned at the beginning, all the way through, you'll see that she's basically saying that's what she wanted to concentrate on. But she didn't want to do it within the vegan society. She said that she respected their kind of focus um, on um, animal issues as the focus and then other issues as the scope. But she wanted to focus on the scope part of it, if that makes sense. So, um, so that's how she kind of went from the one organization to the other. She was born into a very uh, poor family. She remembers, for example, as a child having to go to bed early on some days because the gas uh, would run out. And so it, she was born into poverty. Her father was a speaker for the Socialist Party of Britain, uh, which later became the British Labour Party. And he would give talks on peace and also the dignity of the working class. A grandfather sounds like quite a character. He had unorthodox views and was said to be opposed to Kathleen joining the Girl Guides, which he thought were a bit repressive. They represent the status quo, he thought, apparently. So as a bright child, Kathleen Janaway won an educational scholarship to grammar school, which is the way it worked in, in those days. And in grammar school, she learned the value of critical thinking and the idea of questioning everything. However, she gave up an opportunity to go to university. It was offered, but she gave that up in order to financially support her family. She worked as a teacher instead. This was a plight of quite a lot of working class people in those days, is the fact that you know education and um, helping their family financially was often something that clashed. And so therefore, they would often have to sacrifice their education, particularly uh, for the women, uh, sadly. But that was just uh, kind of fairly standard within uh, the, the working class. <coughs> I hope I don't lose my voice again. She married her lifelong partner, Jack Janaway, just before the Second World War. And like Donald Watson, became a conscientious objector. <coughs> I don't know why I lose my voice when I'm doing these time tunnels. This is the second time it's happened to me. <clears throat> I shall try to uh, speak a little bit lower, see if that uh, helps. So um, both J uh, Janaways and Watson had become conscientious objectors. Uh, during the war years, they both turned vegetarian when Kathleen saw slaughterhouse trucks arrive to take those lambs away that uh, was mentioned before. But not yet vegan, she helped organize a protest meeting for the organization that was to become in later years Oxfam. And the protest was to demand that dried cow's milk was sent to children of allies in mainland Europe uh, during the war. And then we get the move from vegetarianism to veganism. It was her keen ability to see connections between social justice issues that led them really to veganism. Uh, she taught children with learning difficulties. She was a peace and freedom from hunger campaigner and served for many years on the executive committee of the Gandhi uh, Foundation. So everything was, as it were, coming together uh, for her in terms of uh, social justice. Then in 1964, the Observer newspaper in London published a two-page review of this book, uh, Animal Machines by Ruth Harrison. A two-page review is absolutely extraordinary um, it, for those times and for now. Um, and so I think she mentions that in, in the, the long version of the video from the beginning. Uh, so Harrison's uh, new book at the time was called Animal Sh Machines, The New Factory Farming Industry. This was really kind of new 
it deeply shocked the entire nation, this book, the Genoese included. It revealed, for example, that calves are separated from their mothers to be sent to veal units in which they were tethered and uh, not allowed solid food. And so Kathleen Janoway said that Animal Machines, the book, had knocked her for six. It really did, did kind of surprise her. So <clears throat> I do have uh, it here. Um, and I just want to show you a couple of pictures, nothing too graphic. Uh, the, there is a chapter here called The New Factory Farming, A Pictorial Summary. So th this is the first picture, as you can see. Okay, and so this is um, a, a depiction of a calf. Now, so there is what is now, what was then quite rare, but now is the usual thing, you know, a grain silo stood next to a, a I mean, that looks like a broiler unit. It could be, could be a pig unit, but pig units you usually got uh, brick uh, bases. Uh, this this one will be so-called poetry uh, poultry. So there is, there is a couple of um, graphic pictures in this, so I won't show you any more. But the interesting part about it is that for the British audience, that will be the first time they'd ever seen anything like that. And so the shock that Kathleen Janoway expresses uh, went around the nation uh, in that sense. And that's what would have ended up being the prompt for a two-page uh, review um, of the book, which I imagine every author in the world would uh, die for, I suppose. Kathleen says, it was at this point that I realized that these calves were the surplus of the dairy industry and that milk, which nature intended for them, was being fed to us. Now, of course, that's a kind of fairly modern day thing to say, and we still say it. In fact, we've got a quote coming up from Kim Stallwood talking about how the arguments um, back then and the arguments now are essentially the same. Um, I think sociologically, it's something to do with the fact that um, we tend not to uh, identify as animals, and we don't identify as apes, of course. And we don't identify as mammals either. And so, although humans are mammals, and even although we might generally understand what lactation means, it's still surprising for a lot of people to learn that mother cows, also mammals, must be pregnant to give milk. And so you get the arguments about, oh, well, you can create milk without pregnancy, which is true, even in humans, but certainly not the kind of commercially required um, amount, which is why they go through that cycle of repeated pregnancy, and then they are pregnant and lactating. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very tough life for a dairy cow, and that's why she becomes um, so-called um, spent, as the industry say, in a, in a, in some short years, and then obviously sent to the slaughterhouse. So the Genoese decided then they would attempt to live without consuming calf food. She said it, it was the animal issue uh, via her concerns for peace and world hunger that got her into um, all of this. <clears throat> Let me bring this back in. She said, my involvement in the animal movement developed out of these in, in other words, interest in peace and world hunger, uh, particularly when I began to make connections between the different issues. So these, these interconnections were very strong uh, back in those days, and it also wasn't a problem uh, in the movement uh, as it is now. Later in life, she would become involved in something called uh, Plant a Tree for Peace. It was a movement which was started by some of the vegans associated with the movement for compassionate living. But going back to 1964, Kathleen Janoway, just like most people, they had not heard of the philosophy of veganism. They knew nothing of the existence of the vegan social movement, which was only 20 years old at the time. And so 
she was, you know, rather lost and, and quite isolated, like many of them were. And as an early vegan pioneer, she had the same fears that people like Donald Watson, Eva Batt, and Leslie Cross had held when they first went vegan. And that really was, um, is it possible or not to survive without any products derived from other animals? And we've got to remember again that um, when we say this, it seems odd now that it could be a concern, but everybody told them they, they would die without some products derived from other animals. And that included doctors, as, as I've said before, on different time tunnels. So there was a kind of lot against them um, in that sense. Now, although her account is rather disjointed, uh, Victoria Moran, who's uh, written a book called A Passion, the, the Ultimate Ethic, reports on a research trip that she took in 1981 to study vegans, uh, both in Ireland and in Britain. And amongst other vegan pioneers that she spoke to, uh, Moran met Kathleen Janaway, who said that the earliest vegans didn't know if our bones would disintegrate or if we perish in a fortnight. So these were real kind of fears uh, at the time, if you like. Eva Batt, as we've seen already, and she also went vegan in the 1950s, she said that she didn't know how she'd manage. She said, I knew people could live without meat, but without milk, no. I really thought I was going to die. And so some of them kind of internalized that message that they got from their vegetarian friends and from their, their doctors. Animal advocate and author Mark Gold suggested that some of the initial health uh, fears about veganism had been dispelled by the time Janaway became the Vegan Society's general secretary in the 1970s. So things moved on and things got uh, better, as it were. The vegan social movement pioneers not only had a revolutionary vision of the future, but they were very brave trailblazers. So we, we owe them a great debt. <clears throat> I always said that when they got told that they were going to die, they said that we'll risk it for a, a vegan biscuit, which is what they did. And so they went for it, essentially. So by the 1970s, then, virtually all of the vegan society literature was uh, written and typed up and produced by Kathleen and Jack uh, Janaway. In a leaflet from 1972, it's clear that Kathleen understood the power of culture and of advertising. Writing, the chief, uh, there is, there is um, a warning really about the language. Um, obviously, people are a product of their time. Um, I, I did get a YouTube comment saying that perhaps it needs to be de chauvinized, the, the language, but um, you know, people are a product of their time, and I think people watching this will appreciate that. And so I've left the original uh, language um, intact. The chief obstacle to man's survival on this overburdened planet lie in the minds of men. Most people find difficulty in adjusting to ideas that do not fit in with the habits and thought patterns of generations. This is very sociological, especially one as with the feeding habits of the West, both producers and consumers are subject to the high pressure salesmanship of the meat, dairy, and chemical industries. So there's quite an interesting mix of media, sociology, and um, appreciation of the power of socialization in, in there. Now, the Janaways were issuing warning about the environmental crisis, which became really key to them. But they started doing that from the early 1970s. Uh, Janaway pointed out, for example, that humanity was engaged in what she called an all-out assault on the living systems of the planet. And showing that she shared a similar radical vision to the pioneers of the movement from the 40s uh, and 50s, this is in terms of their thoughts about um, the centrality of the moral evolution of humanity. She declared that, quote, the age of the new man is dawning, uh, with the vegan being quote, the prototype of the new man of the new age. Again, a little bit flowery, perhaps, but that was um, 
a common um, idea that through veganism and through the adoption of the philosophy of veganism, uh, a new type of humanity uh, was possible and um, quite likely. And you'll you'll see in the clip that's coming up, uh, say something very similar uh, to that. So the Janoway's house became vegan headquarters in the 1970s. And I always mention this it is ironically situated in an English town uh, named Leatherhead, which is a great place to have a vegan headquarters. So Movement for Compassionate Living report this. Their house and garden became a venue attended by many over the years for meetings and garden parties to raise funds for the many concerns they were involved in. Now, Ronnie Lee, who became vegan in 1972, as many people will know, went to one of, one of these, uh, I believe. And um, he said he, he found it quite an interesting uh, affair. Many will remember Kathleen and Jack's garden as the place where they came together each year with vegans from up and down uh, the country. The meetings provided a um, opportunity for fellowship and um, being with kindred spirits, that kind of thing. And it was especially important for the more isolated vegans who could get together and meet people um, who had the same values as, they, as them. And also it was found to be a really good uh, meeting place for vegan children so they could kind of meet and play together and, you know, actually, as it were, not be weird for a while, I suppose. Mark Gold says that the Janaways' importance to the development and the evolution of the vegan social movement is absolutely huge. He says that Kathleen was all about linking the compassionate desire to avoid animal products with rational use of world food resources. And Gold states that um, uh, over half acre of garden was soon turned over to a horticultural experiment where she and Jack successfully developed green manure techniques, i.e. Manure, manure from plant sources only, food bearing trees, vegetables and fruit bed. Now, many will know that the Vegan Society was featured on the BBC community based TV programme in 1976. It was called Open Door. And reviewing this, um, Kim Stallwood who himself went vegan in 1976, says to watch the show today is to be reminded how nearly 40 years on, many of the arguments made for veganism then remain the same today. That more people could be fed directly through plants and through uh, than through animal pro protein, thus alleviating world hunger. That consuming dairy products involved more rights violations against other animals than eating meat that vegans lower their risk of contracting heart disease and cancers of the colon, that the vegan diet requires vitamin B12 supplementation, although this deficiency also occurs amongst many non-vegans. The latest from the doctors, as I understand it, is that everyone, uh, regardless of their dietary choices, should take a B12 supplement uh, after the age of 50. And that vegans are, according to one of the doctors interviewed, Normal, healthy, happy people whom uh, you could, couldn't distinguish from omnivores except that they are slimmer and perhaps smile more. So <laughs> if that's, um, if, if you recognize yourself in those words, then uh, all, all the better for it. Kathleen Janoway is featured um, at some length in this 76 program, proudly showing off a green manure techniques. Now, the show, and um, Stallwood does um, comment on this too, the show looks very dated nowadays. Um, although Ronnie often says that um, when, when you hear it, it seems so kind of stiff, uh, but it was the way people talked in those days, especially when they're on TV. But it looks so dated that uh, vegan comedian Simon Amstel used sections of the original film in his um, mockumentary in 2017, which was called Carnage. And a lot of people can't tell the bits that he created from the bits that he just used because they were, uh, they were so kind of um, close to one another. Not least because in the 1976 film, 
there is a family, a vegan family featured, and they are Mr. and Mrs. Bland. And so I often think that there goes to show that you know people weren't very media savvy, savvy in those days, because I'm sure nowadays, if you've got a Mr. and Mrs. Bland in a vegan documentary, you'd say, can we just change your name for the duration? Because it doesn't look good. So the production values of this program are very uh, low, but it should be remembered that what was going on was the BBC was, was giving their resources to NGOs and social movements um, to showcase their work. So it was essentially kind of, the BBC would turn up with all their technicians and their equipment and say, okay, what do, we, what do you want to do? And so they would literally just film what these NGOs wanted. So I'm going to show you a little uh, clip uh, from it. Now, I did add some subtitles to it because I think it's probably going to be necessary. So let's see if we can get this going. It's Kathleen January, Secretary of the Vegan Society. Uh, Kathleen, <clears throat> some say that animal manures are necessary for the health of the soil. I know people say so, but there's no real reason to back their statement, no research. Hundreds of gardens like my own grow excellent crops with no artificials, no animal manure, nothing except vegetable compost made from vegetable wastes. After all, animal manure is only plants passed through animals. I pass plants through my compost bins instead. All the inedible bits of fruits and vegetables go in layers in these bins. I cover them, I'm sorry, I cover them with layers of weeds. A thin layer of soil and a sprinkling of herbal activator. And in six or twelve weeks, you get marvellous compost. That grows excellent crops. Last year, we had 200 weight of tomatoes in this garden. Lots of beans. Giant cucumbers and many other crops, all grown from vegetable compost. Why use artificial fertilizers that can do damage to the soil structure and life and cost irreplaceable fossil fuel to make? Why use animal manure when animals need so much land and work to support them, when you can get good crops with just vegetable waste, earthworm, bacteria, that live in small bins. And as for doing it on the wider scale of the farm, why should it be more difficult than cutting grass for hay and silage? Anyway, if England turned vegan, we'd need so much less land to produce food. We'd have wide acres for forests and wildlife and recreation. At the moment, 90% of the agricultural land of England goes to support animals. If we are going to feed people, we have just got to stop breeding these pathetic creatures. The Sahara Desert. Yes, and so uh, Jack um, uh, went on to talk about the Sahara Desert. So they were they did all that composting and then immediately started talking about deserts, which was quite interesting. Uh, as I said, um, Andy has also enhanced that um, that documentary, so that's also on his uh, YouTube channel. Uh, not your mum, not your milk, with a dot after mum, as I said. So Gold claims that some dismiss Kathleen Janaway as a crank. In fact, he's got a chapter. Uh, I think it's called. Uh, Janaway crank or visionary, I think. And that was due to her utopian vision of the future, which, to be honest, was shared by most of the uh, vegan pioneers. So let's bring the PowerPoint back. 
She looked forward with optimism towards a tree-based culture in which animal agriculture would be replaced by forests providing food, a mitigating factor against climate change, which is always called global warming in those days, and preventing soil, uh, soil erosion. She wanted to see a global network of tree-based autonomous vegan villages replacing industrialized cities. So Genoa's tree-based vision of the future is indeed truly revolutionary. It would prevent monocropping, it would end unemployment and refertilize areas of desert. There was even talk about whether money would be abolished as part of Movement for Compassion Living's vision of the future. She was um, she was big on things like bartering and swapping and you know community-based kind of uh, cooperation, I suppose. She was also a great supporter of science, but argued that it had to be guided by compassion. The enormous power of, uh, that humans have needs compassionate direction, she argued. She believed that humanity's moral development had fallen behind and food is part of the reason. This again is echoing very much people like Leslie Cross and, and uh, Eva Batt and uh, Donald Watson. She argues that when parents tell their children that they must eat animal products and are pu punished if they don't, the child must in turn suppress their compassionate side. Interesting social psychology. On the other hand, veganism manifests a properly balanced human being, she believed. In 1986, Janaway wrote, freedom from dependence on the slaughterhouse nurtures faith in the possibility of creating a compassionate age. In terms of active campaigning and advocacy, she said that anger has its place. She also says that in that uh, film that I keep referencing. But it should be an anger that is directed against the act rather than the actor. After all, she argues, you don't change cruel people with more hostility. She said that education is the key to spreading veganism, and this entails us taking the time to educate ourselves. She said that we must be aware that the present materialist, competitive, violent civilization, which has spread rap rapidly through the world, is not sustainable. We need, above all, a vision and hope of a practically based alternative. She also said, time is not on our side. And certainly the daily slaughter of other animals demands urgency in any rate. Once she had moved then to Movement for Compassionate Living, she developed these ideas of a tree-based culture uh, much more fully. Through growing enough trees, she argued, we can satisfy nearly every human need, including that for food, and at the same time, do much to restore and maintain planetary health. Adding, what is needed is a trend towards compassionate living the vegan way. In fact, that's the full title of the, of the group, uh, uh, Movement for Compassionate Living the Vegan Way, with the emphasis on the use of trees and their products. Janaway warned that humans had created a second population explosion of deliberately bred other animals, competing with humans for diminishing resources, which adds to uh, the creation of deserts, erosion, pollution, global warming, and ozone layer depletion. In terms of her position on interconnections, Janaway recognized that veganism must be central to our thinking. And again, echoing the views of the pioneers of the 40s and 50s, or the ones a little bit before her, she un underscores their point that veganism represents the liberation of humans and uh, other animals. And she also states that with great hope, uh, she thinks that an uh, era of true abundant living will dawn in which humans at peace with themselves, with each other, and with all living creatures will reach heights of creativity as yet uh, unimagined. Okay, so let me drop uh, this out.
Um, so that's your PowerPoint, and that's your time channel. It's my PowerPoint, your time channel. Uh, but I'm going to show you a, a last bit of, of a clip uh, which really kind of summarizes everything we've said so far. It's really quite impressive stuff. And um, I hope you enjoyed this one. And I'll, I'll see you again next week for another time tunnel with um, a less croaky voice, hopefully. I'm going to doom swatch a little bit, but not for long. Because actually, I grow more and more optimistic. It seems clear to me that the age of predatory man is coming to an end. He is destroying not only the animals, but the whole planet and himself too. He cannot go on. And the alternative is the vegan way compassion to all life, all the animals, and also to the planet, the plants, and the humans. That's the only alternative. And it is our awesome responsibility to bear the task of introducing that alternative to the whole <coughs> world. I feel that the change will only come when we get the masses of the people changing. It's no good just alone attacking the government. It's no good attacking the industrialists. The politicians will go on until they're frightened of losing the votes. The industrialists will go on until they won't sell their goods. It's the masses of people that we've got to get to, and we've got to raise their awareness. Global warming can be reversed and people better supplied with food and other necessities if we use land for trees and not animal farm. It's not the reform of animal farming we want. It's the end of it. And in a vegan world, as I think you know, there'd be so much less land required to feed people, that there could be wide areas for wildlife where animals can live their own natural lives in their own natural ways, free of our interference. Perhaps they would realize that they no longer need to fear us. And we could sometimes have the privilege of making proper relationship to it. But the general picture now, I'm quite sure, is that the age of predatory man is coming to an end. Will a new age, in accordance with the teaching of the great, follow, or will we go right down, right back, and have to climb up the evolutionary tree again? We've all got a part to play in that. But I think generally, it's hope. And if we can solve this problem of animal exploitation and spread veganism, we should also solve the problems of war and poverty and all the other things that has caused immense suffering to people and animals through the ages. Veganism is as important as that. 